ringer band and all of that. And the reason is, he was born in, in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. And I thought he would be interested to know that. And that he was, uh, he went to Harvard and he studied uh, English literature and architecture. And uh, the transplantation took place when he won a Fulbright scholarship uh, in about 65, 66. And that was renewed in 66 and 67. And he completed his PhD working on the Ringer Band at the London University. Since 1968, he's been a senior lecturer at the AA, the Architectural Association <coughs> School in London. And um, he has published five books, some of, of which we know very well and some of which we don't. So we'll have to talk about that. Um, the first one was uh, Meaning in Architecture, uh, Architecture 2000, Ad Hocism with Nathan Silver, which we have, and Modern Movements, which many of you have read, and uh, The Corbusier Tragic View. He's written articles for AD, Architecture Plus, Architectural Forum, Architecture Review, as well as having uh, written special television material for some programs uh, in London uh, on ad hocism, Peru, and animal architecture. Right? Uh, he has also lectured widely in uh, Holland, Japan, United States at uh, RPA in Virginia, Cornell, Harvard, Columbia, Syracuse, Berkeley, USC. He's presently teaching this quarter at UCLA. And we're pleased to welcome you tonight to Sarah. Thank you, sir. Charles Jenkins. Well, I wish I had more of an English accent. I suppose I would, I'll be disappointing you somewhat. No, no, I don't. <laughs> um, since we're a rather intimate group, why don't, I, why don't we conduct this as a, as a seminar and uh, talking situation as I go along? Because I don't want to just stand up here and and lecture at you for an hour and 10 or 15 minutes. It's, it's too much to, to listen to the kind of remarks I'll be saying, some of which are outrageous and meant to, to elicit a response in you. Um, I prefer that you do respond and not just absorb or believe what I say, because often I say things for polemical reasons which I only half believe, or which maybe I believe a quarter of, a quarter truth, not even half truth, or half-baked ideas. Um, I'm going to be giving a series of lectures on the modern movement, but the first one starts with constructivism, and the next set um, are recent developments in places like Japan and Italy, uh, America and England, really recent developments of the last 20 years, whereas this lecture today is, in a sense, um, going back to the 20s and setting some of the basic ideas of the modern movement. It's curious how these ideas have developed and changed in, in the West um, in the last 10 years. I mean, it's only recently that constructivism has really come into the English-speaking world. There was, um, it's been suppressed for obvious reasons. Um, in books such as Siegfried Gideon's, um, it's hardly mentioned, Malevich is mentioned and a few other constructivists are mentioned in passing, but Constructivism really was never accepted by Western historians for it, the great role it played. And the reason for that was obviously something to do with communism and a misunderstanding of the relations between constructivism and communism. And I suppose if you, maybe the House on Un-American Activities would be here seeing whether my talk is <laughs> pure. Um, but that's very sad, really, um, because the constructivists in a sense, were the first wide movement of the modern movement to, to put themselves across on both a political, social, and artistic level in a full-blown modern style. Um, and they enjoyed for maybe six months or a year, when things were really confused in 1920, uh, they enjoyed running the major schools. So you had a unique situation in modern culture where the avant-garde was actually in control of power um, in the major schools in Moscow and in other places. They'd taken over. People even like Chagall and so on who weren't directly connected with constructivism were head of schools. And this honeymoon period didn't last for more than two years and then a lot of them started fleeing to the West as they saw the Leninist crackdown, uh, Leninism being against Cubism, Futurism, Dadaism. 
he was planning the Russian Revolution when, when the Dadaists were planning their revolution. They were planning to cross the street from each other in Zurich. So um, Lenin had a particular distaste and abhorrence of a lot of modern art, which I think comes from this unfortunate period in Zurich. Uh, but he attacks all these things. And so a lot of artists left and flee to the West. People like Nam Gabo. And it's from Nam Gabo that, of course, we understood constructivism until really the last eight or nine years. And then all of a sudden, an exhibition in London in 1968 was, was the beginning of the high point of re-looking at the period and seeing how very important it was to say, every, every single architect uh, in the modern movement, I think, they were all directly or indirectly influenced. I mean, Corbusier, obviously, but all of the Germans. There was an exhibition, the last exhibition of constructivism in the West was 1922 in Berlin. So that's the jump from 1922 to 1968. And then um, 50 years too late, it's coming back, uh, an interest in them. And one's beginning to know what happened. Well, can I have the first set of slides, please? <laughs> Do you want some help? Shall I? Can't reach that. <laughs> Sorry, Charles. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, there's another one there, isn't it? Did we do it? I just did it. It's not funny. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, the Russian situation is very complex, and like America in many ways, if you go to Russia, you think, gosh, the Russians are friendly, warm, and passionate people like the Americans. They'd had, they'd had revolutions um, every 20 or 30 years in Russia, in 1825 and 1848 and 1871, and a famous one in 1905. And the Russian intelligentsia really had uh, been disaffected from the system of power for probably 40 or 50 years prior to 1917. You get, if you read Chekhov, I mean, you know, you, you see that uh, almost invariably a reincurring theme in a Chekhov play is the, the end of the old order and the despair because nothing new has taken its place. But every intellectual was talking about it. Um, the ruling class, Count Tolstoy, was writing about it all the time. Count, uh, um, well, the, the, the famous anarchists, the, t the two members of the nobility, decamped. Um, Bakunin and Kropotkin, Count Bakunin, Count Kropotkin, the czars were even against the system of power, and which is one, one of the reasons that um, the revolution came about, because the czar's brother didn't want to take over when things got bad in 1917. So this is the kind of background in these small revolutions leading intellectuals to write books called What Is To Be Done. Um, these kind of books still going on now. I mean, Sakharov or Solzhenitsyn or any number of people in the underground in Russia, always looking at their culture in a very strong and passionate way, writing fundamentalist tracts. What can we do now? What is, what is our mother country? I always speak about Russia as a mother. Um, what can we do for her? She's in such a mess. So. This is very important because when the revolution occurs, there's <coughs> a backlog of thinking about what, what to do and a, and a backlog of practice, in fact, on how to organize things. And in terms of art and architecture, even a backlog of, of the kind of style to be used. So that, for instance, the intellectual elite in, in Moscow and Leningrad looked to Paris and they looked, of course, Picasso and, and, and Futurism in, in Italy, and they invented their own kind of uh, art movement called Cubo-Futurism. Well, then 1917, and this event hits Petrograd, now Leningrad, beautiful 18th century capital. And it's caused, in February, the revolution is caused by women striking for bread, interestingly enough. Um, what's called the February Revolution is, uh, is kind of nascent women's liberation. <laughs> And indeed, this has, I mean, has a still profound effect, the, the role of the woman in Russia. Even Lenin gives a lot of uh, talk about, or a lot of polemic about the role of the woman, and this affects, of course, the design of communal houses. Well, the women go on strike, and that spreads to the, 
to different areas. Um, the streetcar conductors go on strike. The place breaks down um, element by element. And all of these groups form syndicates or workers' councils, uh, or Soviets, what are called Soviets, in fact. And the Soviets are something that comes from the 1905 revolution, this uh, form of local self-government um, uh, situated either around a neighborhood or around um, some kind of a function. So you get workers' councils for art, workers' councils for uh, police, workers' councils for every different function. Okay, that is a classic photograph of what happens in a revolution where no one knows what's happening. And it's um, a photograph which I think influences uh, the constructivist art at the time, trying to represent motion and um, almost a nihilistic chaos. Another motive behind it, of course, is, is Marxism. And I've, in this um, kind of pop collage I've done here, a vulgar Marxism, because Marx, of course, denied he was a Marxist. Um, I've tried to show what is the, the vulgar interpretation of Marxism, because it still is the reigning interpretation, of a dialectic between a substructure and a superstructure, with each stage of history coming into being when the two, the, the superstructure and the substructure, come into conflict and there's a revolution. So, say, in the, in the um, aristocratic states of Greece, the city-state was the, uh, the superstructural form of government. It comes into conflict with the slavery and uh, private property, and they produce the next stage of history, which is feudalism, and that generates uh, a new kind of dialectic, producing the capitalist stage. And Marx, coming in here, said, well, the next stage will be brought about um, by the dictatorship of the proletariat. The form of government will be socialism, and it will be based on proletariat uh, form of work. And it will lead, ultimately, to a withering away of the dialectic. The dialectic will stop, and you'll return to a kind of communal situation. I um, don't know if I um, The tribal situation he talks of before history starts is the same as the um, ultimate communist state. Now, this is important for constructivism uh, for many different kinds of reasons, obviously because of social idealism to a certain extent, also because of the dictatorship of the proletariat in a negative way, and in terms of, revel uh, in terms of representation, it's very important because the, the constructivists tried to represent history as conceived by Marx and Lenin. So all of their buildings have our little representations of spirals or dialectics, or as Lenin said, when asked about the revolution, he said it's, um, or the dialectic, he said it's two steps forward and one step back. So it's a zigzag process. He said it, pr it proceeds by leaps and bounds, by catastrophes, by revolution, which is a process that goes like this. Well, you'll see the importance of that in a second. Um, anyway, the, the Soviets sprang up in Petrograd, and then the revolution spread to Moscow, and, and then around um, the country over four or five years. It took, uh, took a long time. And the ideal situation was the ideal that went right back to the American Revolution and the French Revolution. This is the French Revolution of, um, of 1789, when outside of the Palais Royal, quite spontaneously in every coffee shop and so on, up would spring a new form of participatory government based on something like the Soviets. I mean, it was a sidewalk debating cafe which lasted all day. These same forms of social and political organization grew up in Russia. And they did debate all day and all night. And of course, the artists and the architects and intellectuals <coughs> took part in them and were really inspired. So that constructivism cannot be understood, obviously, in one, unless one understands that it had this as an actual organizational base, an ideal base underlying it. But what happens, you all know, is that the Bolshevik Party, as opposed to the Menshevik Party, the Bolshevik Party led by Lenin, meaning bigness, Bolshevik means big and Menshevik means little, takes over and um, starts controlling the political s situation by June and July. And something like 80% of the electorate becomes disaffected and doesn't participate anymore. And by October, 
the time is ripe for a coup d'etat, and Lenin does that and takes over the controls of the government and uh, banishes uh, democracy participation altogether. In fact, gets rid of the uh, system of, of uh, parliament altogether by the following uh, January. And Trotsky, the man who is organizing the army, um, writes a book called In Defense of Terrorism. Right? First title he writes. So the handwriting is on the book, as it were. <laughs> and people, uh, I mean, you know, in spite of it being a great idealistic thing that's happening, and everybody in Europe being really utterly devastated by this um, and thinking it's going to happen in Germany in a minute and in England. I mean, it almost happens in England. All of these major industrial countries um, get very excited about it. This is the new world. This is the end of the First World War. We've got finally something that looks like it might work. Only Bertrand Russell, of all people, um, goes to Russia and says, look, it can't work because of this uh, inherent contradiction. He picks up this book by Trotsky and is appalled and sees, unlike just about every other um, wishful thinking person, he sees what's going to happen. Well, that's kind of a background. And what you get immediately is a representation of that in the, in the new art. And it's L. Lissitsky, who's perhaps one of the first to try to um, put forward a new topography and a new aesthetic, which is on a par with the revolution. Of course, it is preceded, as I mentioned, by Cubo-Futurism. So it isn't as if he all of a sudden came to these two conclusions in 19... 1920 and 1919, with, without having them been, without there being preparation. But this is the new topography, and there's, Lissitsky is credited with having invented it, um, the topography which the Bauhaus then turned into its own style and disseminated through the famous Bauhaus books. The free floating page, a page where um, things are composed on the diagonal. This one is called beat the whites with a red wedge and you see little red wedges chasing white armies across the open plains of black Russia um, and you see topography floating around here you see in different with different typefaces uh, some white some black and so forth it's a it's a very startling kind of topography for its time in fact it's very I'm afraid that's out of focus it was taken out of focus <laughs> right um, but if you put yourself back at that time, you can see that it was startling to read a book that looked like this. First of all, you had to read it far away, and you had to keep moving it like this. And there wasn't always a text, but there was um, words that were thrown at you, like slogans off the street. So this is a very important kind of thing Lissitsky was doing. At the same time, or just a little bit later, he produced this um, photo montage with Lenin up here in a characteristic jutting Bolshevik pose, of leaning out over a rostrum, you know, with his great jaw coming forward with, with a beard and his bald head, in his black suit and black tie. Um, you know, you can see him on the trains as he went through Russia, converting people to the revolution. You can see him in, in Moscow speaking this way. So here he is, a piece of a photograph, in other words, ultimate realism. And for the constructivist, that meant the machine and it meant photo photography, and it meant mechanical reproduction, set against these platonic shapes. And this is the other aspect of constructivism, to confront the realism of the machine, this piece of the Eiffel Tower here, leaning on the diagonal, with photo montage, pure forms, pure cubist forms, which were almost platonic. I mean, they represented the ideal universe. And topography, proletariat, written across here um, as a kind of flag. So Lenin defines the revolution, he, another definition he gave was the, it's, the revolution basically is about electrification plus the Soviets, the Soviet form of government and electrification of the uh, countryside in the American model. In fact, he, he looked at America, and particularly Chicago, for his um, <coughs> kind of ideals of management and uh, production, pr productivity. So that's uh, another beautiful symbol of what it's about. And it's, it's so symbolic that um, one might as well point to it immediately, that <laughs> the sacred symbol for the constructivist is the diagonal. Um, 
you can always find diagonals. See there coming the red wedge coming soon. The the sacred diagonal represents the dialect and it's <coughs> versus the bourgeois flat plane or the aristocratic vertical, right? This is the this is the kind of symbolism that the constructivists put forward. Because it is a dynamic angle after all, and it's neither aristocratic nor dull bourgeois, according to the constructivists. So we'll see it everywhere. Now, another man who'd been working previously to the revolution is Kazimir Malevich, and he did a series of these uh, reliefs and architectural models. These are 1922. These are the kind of things that, that Gideon um, does put in his book and were known in the West, but it's virtually this kind of constructivism, which, as you see, is abstract and cubist, and the one that, that will lead nicely into Mies van der Rohe and Corbusier rather than the polemical one, which is, in fact, a much richer um, a language. One of the interesting things is, is the situation of women there. And the architects and artists had either their wives work along with them or their mistresses. One of the great <coughs> architects, artists, was Rodchenko, who formed his movement called Productivism. And his wife, or mistress, Stepanova, who designed these fabrics and costumes for dance, um, in the theater. You can see what, how, you know, really alive. And it's not just the chevron pattern, but it's a kind of uh, op art before its time. And really, um, I mean, it's very dynamic kind of coloring, full of diagonals again. Kind of patterning that was put on all sorts of domestic things, not only sheets and tapestries tone, but, but uh, a lot of china. Well, the, the role of the theater was very important because the theater was, um, was like a Soviet. And so the theater becomes, for the constructivist, almost the public realm, a place where the, a new social power plant will grow. I mean, they use that metaphor later when they talk about the club. If you imagine the beginning of the revolution occurring almost <coughs> as a thea theatrical event with the with the rising up of the Petrograd uh, Soviets who were, who were on a boat, storming the Winter Palace, you know, bombarding it with their, uh, with their guns, um, and then running into the palace, uh, taking it over, was, was a theatrical event, so that they celebrated it every year. Um, after that, they would, in, in October, they, they'd come out and um, reenact it. 40,000 people would dress up in uniform and uh, carrying guns, some of them live guns, and they'd come in their trucks and they'd stage these mass spectacles. So that theater itself has a, has a great role in liberating design. And you can see with, um, you can see the costumes, the peasant costume designs, you can see designs for, of Rodchenko for the Marx Institute, Marx and Lenin Institute here, where, you know, they're making even use of nails. So. When one talks about the realism and the idealism in constructivism, it's, the, it's, it's this opposition between very prosaic things like rivets and nails and mechanical things versus the pure forms. Sometimes they would take into account, um, you know, local uh, sign systems of, of the provinces when they would have to send these, these trains out into the countryside to take the message of revolution across Russia they would uh, paint the sides of their of the trains and then speak from them with loudspeakers, or they even paint their boats. So that the revolution then really did have a theatrical quality, which was, of course, common to the American Revolution and the French. They all had this um, sudden um, discovery that theater was what it's about. Well, there are obviously similar kinds of things happening in different cultures which relate back to that. And wall painting is, is one where most of the um, blank walls of the streets of Moscow were painted on with slogans and, and op art kind of things, or constructivist messages, some of which the people uh, did understand. Others of them were painted in a realistic style, which then became a kind of comic strip style. And this divided, of course, you can see how this would divide the modern, the constructivist movement into an elitist wing and a kind of proletariat wing. Um, but the wall art situation really grew. And if you go to Moscow today, you can see versions of this. Um, 
not, of course, as creative as the freeway collapse here, um, nor as creative as the constructivist ones of the 20s, but they still, it still goes on. It's, it's a kind of state form of advertising. And they reinvent everything. They reinvent the symphony. Instead of having a symphony orchestra inside, um, you take it outdoors and you conduct it across a uh, landscape, an industrial landscape. So someone, Mayakovsky, the poet, said, invented this form of, of symphony where someone goes up on top of a factory and um, he gets the steam whistles of his factory to blow and then he goes like that and the guy sees him in the next factory, you know, about half a mile away and before he hears it, he has his steam whistles and pipes and organs going full blast. So <laughs> the industrial, imagine that happening in L.A., you know, sort of. Uh, across from one factory to another. It would be extraordinary at six o'clock. It was very nice noise. And they, um, you know, that's how they saw it. They, the, the writers of the time in the Soviets said, uh, down with museums and down with art. This is Gann speaking. We do not need a dead mausoleum of art where dead works are worship, but a living factory of the human spirit in the streets, in the tramways, in the factories, workshops, and workers' homes. So they set an antithesis between a museum and a house where um, the wicked bourgeois collected his art and hung it on the wall, and the kind of utopian idea that everyday life could itself become a work of art. That was, that, yeah. Doesn't it relate so much to Dadaism? It relates to Dadaism, yeah. It relates to Oscar Wilde, too, who wanted work, everyday life to become a work of art. And who, I mean, Wilde was a socialist. It, it's a very strange idea that, you know, you could, you could ha live an, and work an intense life um, that really was a work of art. It leads to all sorts of strange notions. Um, I mean, ultimately, people like Hannah Arendt have said it leads to Hitler, but <coughs> you, you can see how it would. Um, um, but it's a, for, for, the, for the people at this time, it's, it's, um, it's set against the private individual. You see, they, as I've shown a second, they, they, um, they were against the kind of Galbraith idea of public wealth, uh, pr public squalor and private wealth. And so they hoped that this would reverse that situation where we'd have uh, really public wealth and, and people would live privately very, very austerely. It's kind of attempt to transform the individual. Um, here's what they did with religion, for instance. It's an atheistic uh, Easter festival, you see? So you have to take the Christian um, iconography and destroy it, or the Byzantine one. See all these churches toppling off here. On the diagonal, being crushed by the sacred diagonal, all in red. See, black versus red. Um, communism winning, and great pieces of architecture here, symbolizing the new um, state. This building I'll come to in a second, and airplanes were symbolizing um, progressive technology as they saw it. There's the, I don't know where this poster comes from originally. I mean, Lord Kirchner's valet, isn't it, who's looking out there, or it comes from Uncle Sam, who's saying, you must join the, ar you must join <laughs> the army. Anyway, Sam Uncle Sam needs you, yeah. Um, but here's the Russian Ivan saying, uh, you, what are you doing for the revolution, right? Pointing out at you, and transfixing you with his gaze in a peasant costume with, you know, billowing smoke out of the factories below. And this charmingly naive uh, photo montage and, and poster by Rodchenko saying, of a woman, you know, with in her headdress here, saying, you there, come off the collective farm and come inside and, and read more books. I mean, that's the short message of this poster. <laughs> <laughs> the idea that, that, you know, the worker, the laborer, will, will really stop working at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and, and uh, joyfully run in and take a shower and, and crack out a few theories in, in astrophysics. Well, Tatlin, uh, this very curious figure, rather like Duchamp and, I don't know, other Western artists, goes through such funny transformations. Tatlin, um, producing his famous monument to the Third, to the third International here, um, with, you see, diagonals everywhere. In fact, it's, it is an extraordinary representation of the Marxist um, 
progression by twists and turns and spirals and leaps and bounds and by two steps forward and then one step back and then two steps forward and one step back, right? With these, um, it's the Eiffel Tower again, on the diagonal here with a reinforced long here, with inside three pure Philaben platonic bodies rotating at different speeds. The bottom one rotating uh, once every 365 days, this one rotating once a month, this one once a week, and the top one, uh, the fourth one rotating um, every day. Each one of these bodies, uh, pure white elements, containing a different um, organ of the Third International. So this would be the General Assembly down at the bottom, right? And this would be Lenin's room probably at the top. And these revolutions would, of these bodies would, would correspond to the revolutions of the, of the planets at the same time as corresponding to the revolutions of the social order. So this building, which was higher than any building ever constructed, much higher than the Eiffel Tower, I mean, it, it was uh, considered, it was going to be, I don't know how many stories, 160 stories, say, it was the first example of megalomania or, you know, the Bolshevik meaning big and vast and too big, um, which really infects this whole period of, of constructivist architecture. They imagined for... Sorry? The first, the first Bolshevik example, but it's, it's, um, it's common to say Corbusier and, and other architects of the 20s. And of course, it comes from... Right. I mean, Boulay and Ledoux. It goes right back to the 18th century. French revolutionary architects even in, in this, this it was called gigantomania at the time in Russia, and condemned by Trotsky, who said, you know, it's the most ridiculous idea that you could put, it's like putting a little uh, ship inside a bottle and, and making the ship rotate. I mean, what? Sure, sure, please. Uh, do you, what, what value do you attach to this, to this object apart from its, uh, from its propagandistic dimension? In 200 years from now, let's say, if, if someone wants to pay attention to this in, in a more abstract way, I mean, you can. I can ask this question about almost anything you've shown. I remember the sure. page in the book, yeah. with the red going in, the reds chasing the whites, and all of that. Apart from, uh, apart from uh, political symbolism, that mm -hmm. was current, it starts to fade away now after after a lot of years. I mean, do you see a use for this thing beyond the propagandistic use or a public relations use? Because almost all of the stuff you're showing is really art and architecture as public relations, which theoretically is no different from what they do now. They call it something different. Well, um, I think it's radically different in one way, in the sense that it uh, comes from an avant-garde, which is alive and living well in Moscow. Well, Whereas now it isn't. I mean, it's suppressed. You, know? you, you can't do this sort of thing. And secondly, it's creative. I mean, that's a major difference. It's not just propaganda. This, this is propaganda never induced by the central government. You know, Lenin w and Trotsky were against this. But this is the social idealism of the avant-garde. And first of all, it's very important historically because it's these kind of, this model toured all of Europe, went all over. I mean, so if you're, gonna, if you're going to understand, say, what happens in Holland or Germany, if you're going to understand the Bauhaus, I mean, I frankly, as I'll end up with a series, I'm going to be against all of this. I'm attacking, I'm will <laughs> be attacking it all. But um, it is our heritage. It's the heritage of the modern movement. And in a sense, uh, to understand uh, um, a problem, I think you have to, you have to know its, its genesis. I would, um, personally, I find it fascinating as a, as, a, as a way of an artist trying to represent, you know, an abstract ideal he believes well, in. Well, well, yeah. I, don't, I don't know that I asked the question very well. If you, if you look at, at, at Rodin's A Kiss or something, which, which seems to have, have meaning uh, uh, in a dimension which is not a political dimension. There are other dimensions, right? You know, all, all I'm asking you is whether this has another dimension which is a little more fundamental. I mean, which can be related to other things that were done around that time, apart from whether it represents thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Um, or not. Well, I think uh, you know. Th first of all, th th those are wider issues. I mean, those. It's not a simple one-to-one uh, -one representation of the dialectic. It's a very complex one. And what I'm saying was has never been said, as far as I know. I mean, I, I'm making analogies. You know, the. I mean, what it was seen as a propagandist unit in the sense that a motorcycle 
It was meant to ride up this thing, get to the top, and take m and then run down and take messages to the people. And uh, Tatlin, the architect, foresaw um, it as a great radio tower. So from then on, radio towers, you can just see a little bit here, have to appear on the top of constructivist buildings and, in fact, get put on actual Russian buildings. So, you know, in a way, one talks about it as in terms of its influence because um, quite irrespective of whether you like it or not, or you, I, I'm sure it's not propaganda only, you know, I don't, and I don't accept that uh, the kiss is the only <laughs> deep tangential kind of thing a poet or an architect can say about society. I mean, this, this is, to say something about the cosmos is important, right? And he's saying something about um, the way the Russians then understand nature to work. This is a representation of what they understand uh, nature working. It's not just sheer propaganda. So, um, in that sense, I think it's, it will be always valid as a, as a symbol of what a certain age thought of what was happening. Do you accept that? Go ahead. Okay. Right. When Tadlin wasn't doing that sort of thing, then he was doing completely the opposite, um, which is designed very cheap furniture um, out of bent uh, wood and bent tube, and designing um, clothing out of well, the clothing and this stove, the Minimax stove and the Minimax clothing, the, the maximum amount of <coughs> heat with a minimum amount of fuel, and he did very close studies of, um, for both clothing and, and heating equipment to, to do this. So he was, on the one side, he was this very poetic kind of architect, and on the other side, he was an extreme functionalist. And in that division, of course, of people like Duchamp lived, and um, it's ultimately the division that, that drove the, the constructivist movement apart. Another representation. Now, people like Eisen Eisenstein, and uh, a whole series of <coughs> film directors, Bertolt and so forth, filmmakers, immediately <coughs> got involved in, this, in the same sort of thing. You see here the sacred diagonal again, this um, still taken out of uh, October, the, re the, the movie by Eisenstein, showing in typical constructivist style a mixture of the machine as a progressive element. In this case, it's, it's Petrograd, and it's one of those bridges lifting up, you know, and the horse runs over and falls and dies. So it shows machinery versus a diagonal platonic geometry and then, a, and then an animal or organic element. And of course it was Eisenstein who made photomontage and the whole thing of montage into uh, the new technique of uh, film. So again, I mean, there's that's, that's a way in which all of this changes the way we see things radically, quite as apart from the message it's giving. And it's on that that's one of the levels when one looks at it. Now, the Vesnin brothers were um, very key in, in the evolution of constructivism. And Alexander Vesnin, who was a great friend of Le Corbusier, um, started designing these kind of stage sets with his mistress, uh, Popova. This is a stage set for The Man Who Was Thursday, a Chesterton play. And you can see it's drawing there on the left and what it looked like um, on the right. So again, the theater playing a terrific role. In this theater, um, I don't know the story of the man who was Thursday, but one imagines it's a, probably a, a, an English farce of some kind, it takes place on a background where elevators whir up and down, here and here, uh, telephones ring. Um, the whole thing is like a noise box, rather like the Dadas, you know. It's to, to watch the play probably would be a distraction <laughs> because <laughs> Everybody's running up and down, stages, stage, cables are moving, and it's really a, a visual delight. So that, they're doing that sort of thing in 1922. And Popova and Vesnin then design this uh, monument for the Third International. And you can see how far they're going versus Tatlin's monument to the Third International. Now it's become a dirigible or a balloon holding up <coughs> slogans on the diagonal. Third International here, proletariat, sorry, Third International here. Um, and the city is turning into something that's almost disappearing. It's turning into uh, tensile forces, into very thin structures that move. It's like instant city of archigram, if you like. Um, at the same time, 1923, this man, Ludwig, will produce 
uh, an entry for the Palace of Labor competition in a romantic constructivist style. You can see here, you know, the Tower of Babel, and I'll ask you to remember this image of spirals co going up like that, uh, but definitely in the Italian manner. I mean, it's a de Chirico landscape here with a sky hook, again representing progress, and an airplane landing on a dish. Imagine an airplane having to land in that short distance. They all design suicidal airports, and it's something that Corbusier picks up, I mean, from, from them, designing an airport between two skyscrapers. You have to land on a dime. Um, anyway, that's 1923, but to show how radical the Vestines are, one can look at that or look at their entry for the Palace of Labor, and this is the, the second kind of stage of constructivism, where the style has now been formalized, and from now on it will all be variations on this theme. First of all, the program for the, for the Palace of Labor, it had a uh, theater for 6,000 people here, turning bordering on another theater for 2,500 people here, so it was, it was gigantic in conception. Had a restaurant on the top where 6,000 people could eat at once. Sorry, not at the top, but, it, but in this section. It had an uh, astrophysical research laboratory on the top, along with a radio uh, uh, center here, and these are the radio antennae all around here. It had <laughs> Jim Sterling-like vents here, um, and around the bottom was clothed in a kind of um, neoclassical style taken straight from France. I mean, it shows you how aware these Russians were. The Vestine brothers were trained in the Beaux-Arts style, so, and they never forgot Auguste Perret. So you can see the same kind of Perret stripped neoclassicism at the base. So the building, in a way, summarizes you know, the whole movement at, to that time. Here's the, the constructivist graphics here announcing as part of the building, you know, putting advertisement on it saying meeting at 21.30 at 9.30 at night and this is what's happening and a symbol of the Communist Party. So then, you know, the idea even itself, one has to throw oneself back there and say 1923, the idea of putting a palace for labor, you know, it's like a cathedral for labor. You take over a form from the, the previous world palaces and you say it's now time for the for the for the masses and the labor laboring population to come come out of the factories and have their palace and to have libraries in it and so forth well this wasn't built um, you know but it has an undoubted influence on modern theater planning and for instance Gropius is total theater if you look at it in section and you look at the motifs this is what I mean about the kind of history being not known in the West, that um, it's clear that the constructivists have gotten a raw deal. Um, and it's not really until you get people like Sterling practicing in England that constructivism comes to fruition in a certain extent, because if you know this building in Cambridge, it's um, Jim Sterling's Cambridge History Faculty Building. It's, um, you know, it is, in a sense, all these elements uh, Reuse. Sterling quite consciously using that aesthetic. Yeah? Isn't that previous one a lot like, reminds me of this Kenzo Tongi's radio building in Japan? The Yamanashi uh, building. Yeah. The radio center? Right. Yeah, except that it's more, um, I mean, you mean this one? <coughs> right. It's, I think it's more open than Tongi's in a way, although you have the bridge element and the elements framing into each other. Tongi doesn't make a spectacle out of, you know, tension structures and this kind of filigree, nor out of the constructivist graphics, nor so much even out of industrial elements clipped on, you know, stairway towers, uh, elevator towers, or, or large vents. I see the parallel, but I think it's, you know, there's um, perhaps the... I mean, I think it is closer here. For instance, you can't quite see, but there's the mechanical uh, cleaning equipment that is cantilevered off the side of this building, which is a d which is direct quote from the constructors. And Sterling very much sees himself as an inheritor of that tradition. Well, um, a photo montage showing what the revolution was about. You know, here's the famous. Uh, storming of the Winter Palace, you know, the, the Petrograd Soviet in their boat, blowing it up, 
put against a dirigible and a plane and the palace of labor so that artists at the time, Rodchenko, could see it all be meaning one thing and being on the same level. In other words, architects and artists were getting big commissions, were being put in important positions of power and uh, were symbolizing the revolution. The freeze hadn't set in. A, a, a store that uh, the Vesnin brothers designed in 1926, the Mostor uh, department store in Moscow. You can see it's rather hopeless as a, as a department store because in, in, in Moscow, where it goes down below 30 degrees in the winter almost every day, uh, to use glazing, even if it's double glazing, is kind of uh, maybe overdoing it. But it's quite an elegant building. And certainly, if you compare it with other buildings in Europe in 1926, you can see why the, the Vestonians have been claimed as, as really, they should have been put on a par with um, someone like Van Doesburg or, or Mondrian. Here's their great Pravda building, never built, for the uh, magazine, for the newspaper Pravda, which means truth. Uh -huh. um, see if I can focus that. Don't know how. How many of you know this building? Do you, a lot of you know it? I say? You, two of you. Um, well, here's, you know, the time projected on here, the, the name of the newspaper here, which tilts over so the reader doesn't have to crank his neck too much, and the daily projection of the newspaper. So you didn't even have to buy it. You could just read it off the street. And that is the architecture, along with flags, searchlights, beacons, elevators that go up and down. You can just see one there and an open office equipment. So you see, it's the international style plus, and the plus is a kind of super graphics or large scale advertising and representational structures. I mean, um, things, the architecture results in, from an ad hoc compilation of the elements from which it's created. Now, the Pravda building wasn't built, but the, the sister newspaper, Izvestia, was built in a kind of truncated version. This is how I saw it in January, when it was very cold, what, what's uh, finished. And that's what um, Barchin, the designer, had projected for it. You can see it's a building in the international style, again with the graphics on it. Uh, very nice plays between verticals punching through <coughs> uh, horizontals on the side. And you just get a slight uh, feeling of that still in the final um, version of it, set off against portholes at the top here. Who's that? I mean, I think that probably the Russians knew the entries to that <coughs> Chicago. Yeah, Tribune competition. This is a little bit later. It's about 1924, 25. It's Vestia. Well, now, that's the beginning of the movement. And then another group starts, a group called ASNOVA, A-S-N-O-V-A. And they're led by a um, series of different uh, people who take over the Vachimus. Vachimus means um, school, in a way. It's like the Bauhaus. Instead of there being just one Bauhaus in Russia, there's maybe five or six. There's several in Moscow and, and Leningrad. And these schools produce an extraordinary amount of um, constructivist graphics in what's called the formalist style. They're much more expressionist, in a way, than the constructivism I've been showing you. And they're, uh, they have a terrific influence um, in formulating a coherent doctrine, and this is why, in fact, Lenin attacks them. Here you see a portrait of Lenin above an exhibition of the school's work, which is a rather an irony because it's a, it occurred in the in the 1968 ex exposition in London. This is the kind of thing they were producing a city planning, the linear city. So they invent the linear city, for instance, as getting over the contradiction that Marx had posed between the town and the country, and they say the way to get over it is to have a city in the countryside which integrates the, the workers, the peasant, really the peasants, with the workers in the faculty, uh, factories. So that um, linear cities such as this are, are, there, are one of their 
three basic contributions to Western architecture. A work of Lodowski um, in 1921, you can see that he's looking to German, <coughs> German expressionism and masonry structures, but, but still the diagonals there, and you can see turning a masonry structure into uh, something else. Well, he proposed these restaurants would, which would cantilever off the side of the hill um, around Moscow. And if you go there, you find strange versions of them. I'll show you in a second. Or he proposed in 1923 skyscrapers such as that. Or look at these views of um, Stadia. You know? Fantastic swoops on the diagonal of tension structures. There's um, a built version from the Ladovsky studio. It's a Actually, um, it's a large escalator which sits in the Lenin Hills on the outskirts. If you know Moscow, it's sort of circular design. And on the, uh, in the outer circle, just before Moscow University, there's the hills go right up. And they put this escalator b f next to a, a tube stop or a subway stop. When I was there, the most curious thing was happening. People were skiing, um, dressed for skiing, and they would, um, how would they do it? They'd, they'd run up the hill, they'd run up here, and then take the escalator down, and then run up the hill, and take the escalator down, <laughs> and run up the hill. And they used these things to jump on, and they're obviously getting in training. I mean, mad Russian physical exercise. And that's very important to understand this, their belief in what's called physiculture, you know? Well, so here we have the diagonal again, a repetition of industrial forms in a very nice kind of rhythmical pattern. To show you where this gigantism and the diagonalism could go is, is this um, stadium by Korsev, which imagined a racetrack where four different events could occur at the same time. So you'd have horse race on one level, car race on another, motorcycle race on the third level, and, you know, foot race on the fourth. So. <laughs> Physical. Yeah, one, one interesting thing is that just in contrast, if something like this would be done in a school today, mm -hmm. it would be instantly accused of, of either being obviously environmentally insensitive, but certainly with, uh, with heavy right uh, wing inclinations. It's not overtly Nazi. Really? It's at least, uh, I mean, somebody who has a jury would certainly say fascist. <laughs> no, really? You mean for the stadium? Or well, all of this, not only the, the stadium, just, just but the, the, because of the, the scale. The gigantism. Yeah, is that I it? Think, I, think, uh, I think that's, that's part of yeah. it. And uh, the single-mindedness of the thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's only interesting in the sense that it came out of a country which is supposed to represent political antithesis, whether it does or not. Well, in fact, it, this was accused of right, being right-wing formalism, this, this movement, as Nova. So... Um, you know, they felt that too, and, and a lot of um, people well, that would. was just a way of shutting them up, which is a conventional. Yes and no. Yes, yes and no. I mean, I think that at the time they were sensitive to scale and the implications of formalism disconnected from the language that people understood. And so, I mean, it's quite true that Stalini Stalinism would, would use it one way, but, but there were serious critiques of it. Um, Alexei Gans, whose work I quoted you about going into the factory, produced this propaganda kiosk, sort of a, a mad melange of elements, traditional elements here, and these Victrola elements here. Very cute. Um, or this, you know, this incredible chess set, the reds versus the blacks, right? <coughs> and they had to redesign everything, you know, not just atheistic Easter festivals, but they had to redesign chess sets so that, you know, you get two master chess Russian players, and you lock them into s their table. Once they sit down, they can't get out and, and fool around like Fisher, Bobby Fisher. Um, and they redesigned the chess set. So instead of having, you know, kings and queens, of course, you have the people's commissar for light industry. <laughs> <laughs> and all sorts of other captains of industry instead of pawns. Now, one of the first buildings outs of constructivism outside of, of Russia was this uh, famous little pavilion at the uh, Exposition of Decorative Arts in Paris, the exposition which 
led to the, the, the beginning of Art Deco. I mean, this was the one that put it on the map. People looked at this pavilion and Corbusier's, and then, of course, all the Art Deco stuff. This one is, um, I'll just jump forward a minute, in plan has all those diagonals. It's basically two right angle systems of wood, joinery and wood building, uh, set against each other, uh, rotated, so that you get very interesting um, crossovers uh, at the entryway, and you get a building which, which I mean, you can see all sorts of um, Venturian and Morian uh, ideas in planning in this, in this pavilion. Curtain wall on one side, and very sophisticated handling of graphics. I mean, I think a building like this must have had a profound effect on the Germans, for instance, when they saw it, and Corbusier. This has a nice small scale to it. This is a very modest building, which, you know, you feel a certain warmth about. It was meant to represent the workers' club. Where was it taken from? Can you show in the plan? Um, I would guess where it was taken from. I, either this corner or this corner. Should we go back? I don't know. Um, yes. I really don't know. It was meant to represent a workers' club, and Ronchenko designed the interiors. This is by Melnikov, and he came from the Asnova group, and he was the, the greatest, uh, the formalist, in a way. Great architect. He just died two, two or three years ago. Um, design and interior, you see, here with a, with a reading area, a library, so that the idea that um, the working man could come out <coughs> of his um, work in the factory and have this wherever he lived. It would be a collective working club next to his commune. Melnikov designed his own house in the crazy shape of two intersecting uh, truncated ellip ellipses. They overlap. Um, you see, here's one ellipsis here and another one there with these nice diagonal or octagonal windows and a very much on this side, a French, you know, artist's studio with a double height space and north light and all that. Um, so he was doing this and he built this building in 1928. It's still in Moscow. This is the model. Um, and there are pictures of him at the time standing outside his house like a proud owner of, of his domain, and he's, he's in um, sort of a long overcoat and spats, looking like the ultimate capitalist you've ever seen. I mean, he looks like Henry Ford, sort of going like this. <laughs> so it shows you what, you know, that Russia is a complex place. It's full of um, strange things happening all the time. Melikov was designing this, I think it's a cigarette factory in the countryside. Extraordinary, nice wooden piece of constructivism. Melnikov, uh, M-E-L-N-I-K-O-V, Melnikov. <coughs> and his perhaps most famous building is the Rusakov Club in Russia, in Moscow, located on the outskirts, not in the center of Moscow. And that's one of the strange things you find when you go there, is that the constructivists never built in the center. They were never really accepted as the official architects. This club is made up of three different um, general auditoria, which can be either used as single auditoria or used together, three together, the movable seating. And you can see that it's designed on these series of wedge pie shapes so that it forms the classic, uh, forms the classic word in modern architecture of what the auditorium is, a word that becomes, uh, you know, accepted by every modern architect from the 20s on to be used again and again and again. The truncated pie shape is signifying auditorium, right? Sterling using it here in a very similar way. I mean, the cantilevered here, cantilevered structure off a vertical uh, circulation element. Sterling, of course, is use, outdoes the constructivists, just like Corbusier, who was fascinated by the constructivists and wanted to outdo them. Sterling smashing up another building through it and, and, you know, putting this below it, putting glass below that heavy concrete weight to create the most, even more, greater tensions and, and violent juxtapositions than the constructivists themselves did. So Malikov really um, being extraordinarily aware. Can you just switch this um, slide to the right? But you'll have to turn the, the um, cassette. 
Just push it. I just want to show you what Melnikov could do. No, the other way. The other way. To what he could do to a parking garage. He designed a very rational parking garage to get the maximum amount of cars in and with the minimum amount of turns. And then, um, in reinforced concrete, and then he holds it on these caryatids, on these giant Herculean figures here. All right. I mean, among other things. He, that, those, that's not the only structure. But he's playing a very ironic um, game, which, again, is startling for its time, you know, to use the juxtaposition between heroic figurative sculpture coming basically from Athens and juxtaposing it to constructivism. So again, it's a richer vocabulary than a lot of other pioneers are using. Now, the Workers' Club is, after the linear city, is the second contribution to I think, uh, the world scene, as it were. Um, they imagined, they speak about the workers' club. It comes from the palace of, of labor, basically. It's generated from that model. And the workers' club is seen as a place where they call it the social power plant. They use that metaphor. It's like, a, like an industrial plant. It's meant to transform the individual into a collective human being. They formulate all sorts of methods for doing this. Um, theater, group theater, um, that gets over the difference between the spectator and the performer. Several of these workers' clubs are realized. This is one by Golosov, Golosov, 1928 in Moscow, too. Um, and these workers' clubs are attached, as you might guess, to sporting clubs, so that <coughs> the sporting clubs being a form of of social organization, they pool their money, trade unions pool their money, and they built a few of these things. This one always illustrated as an example of that, of the, of the purism of constructivism, where you get pure um, cylinders in glass being wrapped around by rectangular um, elements in reinforced concrete. And again, it's the juxtaposition, this violent juxtaposition of one pure element versus another. I found it very curious when I visited to see that it was painted in Mediterranean pink, stucco. I mean, like, as if it really were a building out of um, Italy or something. The bottom, element is gone. the bottom element's gone, yeah. And the lettering's gone, too. That was just taken in January when I was there. How was that used? Was that like a signboard? Yeah. I think this probably was a signboard. The, the idea of the, of the workers' club was the um, was to have local um, theater every night and to have a reading rooms and places that really could work in part of the community. But they they they've turned often into cinemas, where they have a, a theater for movies. I'm not sure what that mm -hmm. actually says. You know what the original color was? I don't know what the original color was either. No, <laughs> I think gray. I've seen gray, uh, sort of beige colors. Now, a group uh, grew up against the Asnova group and, f and uh, because they thought it was too right-wing. And, and this group was considered uh, too left-wing by the Stalinists. And th this group was called OSA, O-S-A, the Organization of Soviet Architects. And they really had the uh, strong power. They were led by a guy named Moses Ginsberg, who was a very good friend of Le Corbusier and who translated Corbusier's uh, books into Russian and sent his books right back, which were virtual um, Russian versions of, of Corb's books. I mean, it's extraordinary. When you think of the international style, what the international style means in a very real sense is that there's international links between Paris and Moscow and Berlin. And these people are as aware of each other as they would be if they lived in the same city. So Asa, under Ginsburg, starts designing the self-built housing uh, and illustrated in this comic book technique where, you know, you take your beam builder and you put it, I mean, you take your, of course, collective housing. And this is the third contribution that the constructivists have been said to make, the, the idea of the, of the dome communa, the communal house. They produced many different types. One, this is type A communal house, which has the interlocking section of um, a double height space here um, with a central corridor off it. So the central corridor, you come in here and go down a stairs, and the apartment unit interlocks then as a kind of L shape here, or the next one up here as an L shape. 
And this gets you economies, because you only have to stop an elevator every third or fourth floor. So you have in the communal house, you have this basic rationalized um, planning, what they call miniaturization. They try, rather like Fuller and other people, to, to, to really miniaturize the, the elements of architecture, which of course is going to cause a disaster in three or four years. Uh, from the design of these things, because it's much better to move into a bourgeois apartment with lots of extra space when you, when you have 16 people in your family than it is in a minimal, miniaturized, white uh, machine. Anyway, um, the, the positive aspects that they have, and this is very conscious, is, that, is they start interpreting Lenin, what Lenin says about the wife, for, for the woman, that um, she's a woman who is, is turned into a slave because she has to do everything in the house, so just clean and be a nanny and... Um, and cook, and so and so forth. So Lenin says, let's take her everyday activities and split them up and collectivize them so that there'll be a communal hall to eat in. There'll be um, communal wash area and so forth. So that's one of the reasons these communal buildings are built. An, an obvious other one is just simply to um, solve the housing problem. This is type F, uh, staggered setback um, individual apartments on a corridor, on a linear corridor. And this is built uh, by um, Ginsburg in, in Moscow, the Narkomfim uh, Collective Apartment Building, 1928, in a kind of, you can see how much it's influenced by Corbusier in, in visual terms. And in fact, in design terms, in conceptual terms, it's very much like Corbusier's uh, apartment block of 1922, which they knew, which Ginsburg knew well. Okay, so that's the kind of thing they're doing for collective housing. And you again find people, you know, like Sterling picking up directly from constructivist design. For instance, Sterling's um, St. Andrew's dormitory is designed so that the sunlight comes through here, so that the collective um, internal circulation allows sun to penetrate it. And so, I mean, almost a drawing like this generates uh, the Sterling building with setback stairways and a communal um, corridor around the, s the uh, center of the building, two stories up, two stories down. So this kind of, um, again, this kind of the importance of constructivism, in part, has, has not been acknowledged fully and is really very profound. Well, it does turn into um, what I suppose would be called a behavioral sink and a nightmare, these, these communal houses. And that's one of the reasons the Stalinist reaction, which I'll be getting into shortly, is so effective, because this apartment block, this communal house, is so regimented and the lives of the inhabitants are so restricted that they're, you know, asked to wake at 6 o'clock, at 6.10 they take a shower, at 6.14 they make their bed, at 6.30 they're done having breakfast, putting a spoon in their mouth at 6.31, back up and doing physical exercise at 6.45. The idea was really to minimize, you know, everything um, so that you, you adopt these ideal forms of octagonal forms or triangular forms which uh, minimize the out exterior of the building in circulation. And they even said, well, since the ideal individual relates to the collective, we give every individual a cell. And if he wants to form a group with someone else, i.e. he wants to cohabit with someone, he actually literally breaks down the wall and he cohabits with his neighbor. You know, going right back to the <laughs> origin of the word. So you, you cohabit two rooms together. You give him an ax and he goes to the wall and that's how you form a home. Well, you can see what happens when you overcrowd, when you, when you move into these uh, little boxes where everything is really, the kitchen has shrunk, you know, from the big high ceiling to the one just, you can just get into. It, um, there's a reaction against this architecture. It's, it's termed inhuman, uh, mechanical, geometrical, and so forth. This is the kind of thing that's being built about this time, 1930, to show that constructivism, you know, did realize a few of its ideal um, situations, a planetarium, where, the, where the, maybe the laborers couldn't come off the fields and crack out of theory and astrophysics, but, but someone was. Um, but about 1927, 28, 
if someone can stick down that other slide, it just hasn't gone through. Um, uh, a new part of the movement gets underway, what could be called ethereal idealism. And they produce these extraordinary schemes for um, the Lenin Hills. Those are the hills that I was telling you about, where nature, beautiful nature, rendered like Corbusier, and man-made things like skyscrapers or um, sporting events here, and technology and radio towers all get on in, a, in an idealistic and sublime way. This representation shows, I think, that even in 1929, things looked incredibly rosy. If man could produce an industrial landscape where there was no pollution, where planes really could be like birds and flutter around, you know, above um, things like that, and it was always sun-drenched sun and healthy, it, um, you can see wh how idealistic that was. Well, the man who took this further than anyone is Leonidov. And in these schemes, the Lenin Library, for instance, he proposes extraordinary mixtures of large-scale schemes with this very platonic geometry. He designs a reading stack here with 40 million volumes computerized to be brought down. I mean, he, you know, he invents the computer mentally. And he, <laughs> he invents television mentally, too, Leonardo, extraordinary man. Um, he designs this building so that a, a person can sit in the reading room on baking in this glass like a tropical plant. Um, you know, it's a round reading room with um, people sitting around the edge of the stadium-like shape. Suspended. You see how suspended? And held by these tension members. You can sit there and request a book and it come whipping down, automated, across there and then up there. Come to him. Or you can go in more specialized rooms, study rooms here. The architecture itself. Um, Leonidov invents so many um, new forms a building that's part compression and part tension. Um, and when the, the Russian architects talk about it, they talk about a new feeling of space. You know, it's what they call a field force of space here, where uh, almost on a regional level, lines are sent out, and the, the distance is taken in by these elements that radiate out into it. So this is the Lenin Library of Leonidov, 1927. Leonidov was a very young man at this time. He was only 25 years old, and he came up through the, the Vichimas, and he created the scheme, and it caused a terrific furor, polarized everybody, so that Leonidovism became the disease, the worst kind of um, crippling disease that Stalin could accuse you of. It was even worse than formalism. And it obviously, um, you know, exerted a terrific pressure on the students at the time. Here is... Um, a scheme he did for a palace of culture, 1930, where he does really invent regionalism. And I mean, all of, uh, if you know Cedric Price's Think Belt and, and his schemes, very much influenced by this. Bucky Fuller's geodesic dome here, 20 years before Bucky thinks of it. Um, you know, visiting dignitaries come and, and uh, buy <laughs> to, to, to come to the palace of culture in these blimps. The whole thing being. You know, again, I mean, Super Studio preempted here. There's, it's all there. <laughs> Poor Leonidov never built anything. Um, his son's alive. He was discredited. Sorry? Yeah, I don't think the Super Studio builds anything. Either. Oh, well, but that's a different story. I mean, Super Studio builds uh, in Japan. The Japanese built it for them and sent it to, them, to the mail. Um, and they never really intended to build. Whereas Leonidov, you know, in a way, um, had, uh, I think, more of a commitment to buildings than Super Studio. This is what happens to, to constructivism from within. It turns into the 101 fantasies of this very adept, facile William Pereira of the constructivist movement. Um, you know, zoom, zoom, zoom. Uh, Chernichevsky. Um, it's a... Uh, it's kind of, it is a formalism, it's very seductive. It's actually in brilliant colors, in blues and reds and greens. Peter Cook likes it very much. I think it's very decadent, but, but nice. Um, anyway, that's what happens from within constructivism. It turns into that sort of thing. And 
Along comes the famous Palace for the Soviet Competition, 1931, and, and the, the modern movement in Europe and in Russia are trying to really create the final links. So that CM is invited to go to Moscow and meet in, in Moscow in 1931, and they have this great competition. Corbusier sends in this, his scheme, which is a gigantism of an extraordinary kind. It's, it's about six or seven theaters here, one for 6,000 people, under one parabolic arch, which holds in turn another structural mem series of structural members here, which in turn hold a third structural ceiling here, uh, sorry, structural roof, which in fourth holds an acoustic ceiling. So it's construct, you know, the word constructivism does mean construction and making a fetish out of, uh, <laughs> you know, out of structure. So there it is. Corbusier showing, like Sterling, that he's learned the lesson, but trying to show the Vestnines that he can even beat them at their own game. Well, theaters 4,000 here, different theaters going along, until you get to this outside pop concert theater for 40 to 50,000 people. So Corb taking on, you know, the Bolshevik uh, ideal at, on a straightforward level and thinking of reenactments of the storming of the Winter Palace outside there. What Corb actually builds in Russia is this disastrous Centrosoyas building, uh, building for light industry, for, um, it's an office building, and it's the most depressing work I think he ever did. It wasn't realized according to his plans particularly, but it's just enough his to make, make it embarrassing. Um, constructed out of red, but now brown, tufa stone and double glazing here. A very kind of monolithic, bureaucratic, uh, faceless monster. But it wasn't maybe his fault so much. Anyway, this is what happens to constructivism, is that Malevich gets turned on his side, or that um, drawing I showed you for the Palace of Labor, the spirals, um, the building I asked you to remember, or even the building, the, uh, the monument to the Third International, gets turned into this. The zigzag progression by spirals and leaps and bounds becomes uh, um, a, a regression by wedding cake on a series of um, levels. This building uh, by Eofon wins the competition for the Palace of Soviets, competition 1931 and 32. Actually, Korb wins, but then he's disqualified for being a mad French bourgeois. Um, <laughs> and so, and the, the Europeans are then uninvited. All of a sudden, they all get, a, you know, they get told, uh, maybe six months before they're supposed to come to Moscow for this big meeting, this big international meeting, they're told to forget it, that they're not welcome any longer in Russia, that the party line has changed. And what's happened is Stalin has said that um, socialist realism will reign in all the arts. In philosophy, it means returning to a kind of nationalism. In, in art, it means adopting um, a, re a photo realism, not quite photo actually, but a 19th century realism combined with socialist message, which means it has to have moral uplift, it has to have a socially redeeming propagandist message. And in architecture it means columns for the people, um, because since the people have taken over the banks, the capitalist banks, they must have the columns which went with them too. And so therefore, you know, they symbolize power to the capitalists, therefore they must symbolize power to the proletariat. And so in this competition for the, the palace of the Soviets then, what could be more fitting than to have a wedding cake of more columns than have ever been put in one building on a building that's higher than the Empire State Building, it's gonna be higher than that, which will be topped out the last 50 stories by <laughs> our master striding across <laughs> The landscape with outraised arm, you know, saying, go forward, you, um, with the dialectic. Well, it's extraordinary. When Frank Lloyd Wright visited Russia, he thought this was terrific. He said, yes, of course, this is great, because um, Lenin, and you know just as well as I do, that, that um, this style of mania or this, you know, grander mania is ridiculous. And, and clearly you're showing that Lenin's jumping on all these columns and crushing them <laughs> and is against them. That's <laughs> right being the most naive 
of, I mean, he said that with a straight face, I think, maybe. <laughs> anyway, he toured Russia at the height of the purges in 1937, when it was this architecture, you know, crushing Leonidov and every, all of the constructivists out of work, most of them put in camps, a lot of them dying before 1940. So this is the reaction, and it's a very curious reaction. Um, so look at the building in a minute. Uh, it's designed, this is the base of it. And, um, you know, they excavate and excavate and excavate. And you can imagine what's happened. Um, they never got beyond the basement. So <laughs> when you go to Russia, I swam in this in, 20 f in 30 degrees below zero. It's fantastic swimming pool, biggest swimming pool around. And you swim in these different niches, you see. <laughs> the women go in one set. And, and strip and, and are washed, and then they go through, and men another set, and you go, and then you go through a um, cave, and you swim out underneath the water into the segment here of the pie, or into one segment, then you can swim into the other segments and meet someone if you want. Um, so it's this gigantic circle here, and very nice indeed it is, but not quite what Stalin had in mind. Um, Stalin said, used a very curious um, dialectic himself in crushing the opposition. He cr crushed Trotsky opposition, the leftist opposition. Um, and then he crushed, after he'd gotten rid of Trotsky and sent him packing, and all of the, the people who wanted permanent revolution, then he took on the anarchists in the right wing who wanted to go slower, who, want, who didn't want to collectivize the peasants. So Stalin said, I'm in the center, you to the left, or too far to the left, you to the right, too far to the right. Only I know where the center is, you see. Um, and he said, furthermore, he did this architecturally too, it's really fascinating. He said, you know, left wing, um, os the left wing OSA group is, is a group of um, hardcore functionalists who are boring, mechanistic, geometric, um, doctrinaire people who are way, who are irrelevant, who don't understand machinery uh, anyway and want to turn us into geometrical people. Whereas the right wing, the formalists, are too fanciful and can't really understand basic things. And then he says, and he says this politically, really, um, I have always said that the left wing and the right wing are in fact the same wing, and they touch. So by a Stalinist paradox, you know, um, heads he wins and tails you lose. It's a kind of dialectic that he plays one against the other and then claims that the extremes are the same. So he can have designed all of Moscow on this model of um, you know, socialist realism so that grand columns march down like the Champs-Élysées endlessly and culminate on this wedding cake of Lenin here, <laughs> top. Um, and of course, it's built all over the communist world. It's built in Bulgaria in their palace of culture. It's built in uh, Warsaw. Go there, you can see it. Um, um, a gift of Stalin to the people, the happy people of Poland. Um, stuck right in the center of Warsaw. Imagine sticking this imperialistic symbol of um, Russian culture right there. It's, it's basically a symbol of the Kremlin because the Kremlin has these towers that, that ziggurat up. Um, and it's, it is the Grand Domania. Right back, there's everything, almost everything that Tatlin and those schemes that I was showing you talk about, right? Theaters for 8,000 people and four of them, and dining rooms for 6,000 people is there. It's all there, you know, radio and television. But it's in this style. It's really a curious twist of fate, which even Marx in his most supreme ironic moments couldn't have predicted. The thing being topped out in the Polish style. This, this much from here up is nationalist. And, you know, that's how much Stalin would give his satellite countries. You can find it everywhere you go. You can find it in, in China. Um, well, back in, that's the Moscow University. So seven of these gigantic towers built around. This one is for 18,000 students live in this small little building. Um, and this is the the Stalinist gift to the people of, of China um, in Shanghai. It's the um, place where they have exhibitions. But many of these things exist in, in Mao's China as, uh, as during the period of, of friendship between the Russians and the Chinese. Um, and what happens 
down below ground is the same sort of thing. They have all of the, the metros constructed. The metro, <coughs> or the, what do they call I guess they call it the subway, is, is their symbol of efficiency. You know, here it is, the, the mechanism symbolizing progress. They take over the constructivist me message. Electrification, very much in evidence here, but it's seen between, you know, the palaces from Leningrad, the, the Baroque and Rococo yellow palaces with gilt mosaics in the side. Or here's a modern one, kind of. This is the one to Mayakovsky. This is the one under uh, one of those wedding cakes, actually. Extraordinary um, underground systems where trains uh, swoosh in almost without a, a bit of noise, every, exactly every minute and a half. And as you can see, the marble is completely polished. Um, it is a fantasy of efficiency. Um, it's as if you take, take the palace and you put it underground and give it um, you know, for a different function. People like um, Shushev, who designed the Lenin tomb and who was a full-going constructivist in 1930, by 1934 becoming Stalin's famous, uh, fa one of his favorite architects, uh, completely reversing field and producing his form of grandomania. And then finally, the, um, his building, which heralds the first building built in the style, 1934, is now the in-tourist um, center where you go as a tourist if you want to get any information. You go to this uh, building. You can see it's, it's basically Palladio with uh, modern plumbing and, and curtain walling between, you know. It's that heroic order um, in the classical style. This is back in Warsaw, the interior of the Palace of Culture. <coughs> so the buildings I'll end with, um, showing this curious inversion of the dialectic. On the one hand, Shushev having produced that in wood, originally in 1925 for Lenin, Lenin's tomb outside of the Kremlin. Here's the, those, that's the wedding cake that leads to the other building producing this in a constructivist style, and then constructivism being, being reduced to nothing by 1933 and 1934. And then by 1960, the thaw in the party line occurring in a very curious way, because <coughs> people like Oscar Niemeyer are communists, and because Niemeyer looks like, his work looks like Leonidov, all of a sudden in Russia, um, Modern architecture becomes acceptable. It's, uh, apparently, what happens is that Khrushchev comes to to the United Nations. And when, when is that? About 1958, 59? Do you remember when he bangs his shoe on the table? Remember that? What is that? About 1959, is it? Remember? Anyway. Khrushchev comes to New York, and he sees it. And he says, that's what I want. No more wedding cakes for me. This, this means advancement. So he gets back to Russia, and he tells his architects to do it. And so they do. And they produced the Hotel Rossia, for instance, uh, with 6,000 bedrooms, 12,000 people, you know, it's in this kind of grandomania uh, international style. And that's what's being produced today. Very sad uh, epitaph, I suppose, on constructivism. That's the, the end. If there are any questions, I wouldn't mind answering them. Do you, do you think the decay of uh, what happened in the early 20s uh, was inevitable, given the kind of uh, tendencies, uh, uh, the imperial tendencies, the fact that Stalin took over? Do you think we can foresee, given, given the fact that uh, those kind of tendencies have been around before. You know, I think I think they were there in the church. You know, when the church came out of the catacombs and you found, you found Christ up in the ceiling. You know, that that kind of thing. And Lenin started down and finally went up on top of a building. You know, that that kind of thing. I don't think there's anything in ever about about it at all. I mean, I don't. I'm not. I don't, don't believe. Don't seem to be any precedent for the reverse. 
And there seems to be a new well, precedence for the You know, both, both Marx and Lenin said that they hoped the, Rus the revolution wouldn't happen in Russia. And um, the reason they said that, although it's not officially quoted, but they said that was because Russia was a terrifically backward nation. And it had only 4% of the population was proletariat. That meant 96% of it are peasants. And you can't have an industrial revolution in a country <laughs> run by an elite, you know, which doesn't turn into something like this. I mean, that, in part, that right? That contradiction, I think, is, is kind of obvious and, and has, and has been poor. I mean, if, if for example, uh, one would, would literally uh, read Marx, there wouldn't be any communist revolution in China or Russia, but it would have happened in Germany and England. So. Right, right. So what happened, in fact, was something which, which was very different, although it picked up a vocabulary that suited its interests, but didn't, in fact, represent, I think, what it claimed to represent. You mean and the constructivist vocabulary didn't? Well, not only the, con the constructivists were, I think, looking back in, in many ways just a bit naive. I mean, they had a kind of energy is almost adolescent, I think, that you have when, when, when a revolution starts and people, uh, particularly uh, what's, what's known as the intelligentsia, has a lot of enthusiasm and wants to get, get rid of the old things and so on. But was, what was really happening, I think, was, was quite different. And if you go, and I, I know you've quoted Lenin, but you can, you can Lenin also said, for example, uh, very, much before the revolution, that any socialist government that came to power other than by uh, electoral means would be, would be ipso facto dictatorial. And it, tur it turned out... Yeah, but he believed in a dictatorship of the proletariat. Well, whatever exactly that means. I mean, it means a dictatorship of him, I think, yeah. with, with, a certain, with a certain amount of rhetoric. But if you read, for example, his will, I mean, he wasn't really around very long. He wrote a very interesting will. I don't know if, uh, I don't know, in your study of these guys, have you seen it? But it's, but it's an interesting thing because it predicts a, a number of things that Stalin did, and it says, yeah. look out for Stalin because he's going sure. to do all of these right. things. Well, I mean, you're asking many different kinds of questions. Personally, I think that if, that the seeds of, of Stalinism are definitely within Marx. I mean, if, you, if you're going to formulate a dictatorship of the proletariat as a, as a, as a government, then you've got a problem on your hands, which, um, and I think <coughs> that's a logical problem because it, uh, no dictatorship will ever give up power. Well, I think Willingly, the right? Is that the seeds are somewhere else, and that they mm -hmm. that they don't have anything to do with Marxism, but uh, but that Marxism is just another manifestation of the problem. You know, I mean, you're looking at you're looking at these big things. Which is that you have echoes of Versailles, for example. Yeah. You know, I mean, they've got these acanthus leaves up there. They have echoes of Rome. You know? But but what are you saying then? That you believe in historical, no, I'm not, I'm that, that fascism always rises to the top? I, would, I don't know whether you want to call it fascism or not. I, I think, uh, and I don't know whether you want to say it's the top or the bottom. Well, it is the top now in Russia. I mean, you know, it's still, it's still, it's still ruled in a very fascist way, Russia. Well, a fascist is anything that you don't like and is dictatorial. No, I well, mean, all right, totalitarian. Totalitarian, like totalitarian if you want. Better. Right, right. <laughs> it is better. Yeah. But it is totalitarian. Absolutely. Right? Sure. Yeah. And it needn't have been. I don't, well, I mean, I don't think it needed. If, it, if there well, hadn't been. I mean, this is obviously just a personal aside, but I'm looking around for some example of a revolution which has a certain amount of energy, the American a certain one. amount of idealism, which finally, <laughs> which finally, which finally, yeah, I heard you, but I'm not so sure. Well, which finally leads to something else. We just did away with the building. We have got our statue of liberty with the building. Yeah. 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 How about modern gigantism, like corporate images yeah. that have a great effect on the kind of architecture and the kind of construction of In where, in in though? In, in this country. In this country. <laughs> That's the same tendencies. I mean, in a way, I, I sympathize with, with what 
I think you're saying there, and, and what you're implying too, is that um, if you look at the history of bureaucracy, apparently it's been with us since the, uh, the Egyptians. Um, the Egyptian pharaoh Akhenaten tried to break the uh, bureaucratic priest class and, and did for 20 years, but it reverted. So the bureaucrats have, uh, it looks but like you know bureaucratic what determinism. You know what they did to yeah, yeah, right. Try to destroy every vestige. You can't right. find out much about it. That's right. But uh, so I, you know, there's the kind of case to be made that bureaucracy is a kind is a is a permanent condition of man, and yet it seems to me some cultures get it under control a lot better than others. And American corporation um, statism, if you like, or the, what's good for General Motors, good for the states, is um, actually permeating Russia now. If you if you look at uh, the multinationals invading Russia, it's what I'm now interested in is, is that link up. You find um, these curious, you know, wor the world system of economics is, is starting to to generate certain, actually architectural, the wor a World Trade Center is going up now in Russia, which will match Yamasaki's in New York and the one in Brussels, which gives you and is the Tishman here? And is that what is there? A World Trade Center? There is here, isn't there? Downtown. No. So <laughs> there are some interesting parallels, or, or depressing parallels. Anyway. Can, I, can I ask you another question? Just a personal question. Having having read uh, uh, a number of your books, I, I remember in this. In, I think it's the introduction of this modern movement of architecture. Something is, and this is obviously a paraphrase, but something to the effect that there really isn't a strand of history, but there are kind of bits and pieces that pick up. That one guy comes along and Gideon does this, and then and then Bannum comes along and does that, and, and and people are picking up different strands, but always seemingly with the attempt to do something which is kind of linear. You know this following that, but that that's not so. In mm -hmm. fact, that things are a bit more confusing than that. And I just wondered if if that's if that's a fair paraphrase. It seems a little bit that what you're doing here is now some is a little more conventional. That what you what you try to do is that you show this stuff and and to show it as as a kind of a link. In, in a sequential chain, you know, that leads, that leads uh, to people that we know a little better. Yeah. You know, that is, and it's, it's conceivable to me that that's, that that's a caricature of what happened. I mean, it, you, you know what I mean? That, that it's not, uh, that, that, you, that you try now to draw this line that you argued a little bit against in your book. No, I mean, I, I think that a historian can't help but draw, I mean, his, he works on the influence of ideas and forms and social events, and those are linear. But what I was trying to argue for was a plurality of, of linear <laughs> things. And to show, I mean, in the diagrams, uh, evolutionary tree, show how they, it's not a simple straight line. You may, it may jump from one plane to another. And um, the, the things wax and wane like evolutionary blobs so that um, but you still have to, you know, you can't write a coherent, um, you can't tell a story, and in fact, you can't bring out the linkages unless you do show the different, what I call different traditions. Right. But Where you always have to kind of choose something yeah. and inevitably leave something else out. That's right. I mean, it's like this thing that they did at the, the Museum of Modern Art recently. Mm -hmm. uh, and all of a sudden, everybody is, is uh, saying, what happened to all of that? The last 60 years. I mean, there's what do you mean, the, the Beaux Arts? Yeah. 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 I mean, you haven't right. mentioned that yet, you know, as a neglected uh, dimension. <laughs> well, I mean, um, I certainly showed a lot of it today. <laughs> I mean, under, you, uh, under the guise of something, that's so. That's so. Yeah. Absolutely so. But right. I mean, that's Beaux Arts with a vengeance. And, um, you know, it's one of, I personally think the Beaux Arts. Revival, if that's what it is, is uh, a, mis a misunderstanding of um, what the, the 20s was about. The fact that Arthur Drexler and the Museum of Modern Art could uh, look at that in the way they do, you know, as the antithesis, is to me 
the is is that terrible story of you know the drunk walking from one side of the street to the other not understanding w that he's walking on a street and just blindly careening from side to side i mean i think to replace boring modern architecture by even more boring sterile beaux-arts architecture is but like he is said, uh, it's going on here it's yeah. going on here only you just didn't make reference to it as that I mean, it's yeah. not going on anywhere by the time Stalin is, is running the show. Yes, it is. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I did make reference to it, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, I didn't call it Beaux Arts, but. Yeah. I mean, it's called socialist, socialist realism, is what it's called there. But it is um, definitely Beaux Arts classicism of a kind. It's Baroque uh, classicism with the bits of nationalism mixed up. It, it follows very directly the Stalinist line. I mean, if you, if you, Stalin's quite clear on, in defining the, the right mixture of technology, nationalism, and classicism. The thing is, you can take those words and you can apply them uh, to Malevich, for example, too. No, I'm you saying that when I show Malevich tilted up and compare him to that, it's to show that, you know, there's certain things that are even absorbed within the Stalinist reaction, elements of constructivism. That's, you know, always that constructivism lives in a kind of, in the programmatic sense, in these grand palaces of culture. Not in a visual, in a visual or a creative sense. It doesn't live at all. But mm -hmm. in, a, in the mad grandomania sense it lives. As a tourist, <laughs> I made contact with a lot of Russian uh, individuals. Just luckily, because of a friend, and it's curious how you know, as people, the Russians. I mean, they are very much like Americans. I find um, in their homes, they have a terrific, uh, warm family life, but officially, the culture is completely rigid and and. Uh, boring and dull and mass produced in the, on a very low level. So that you, you, you get that strange sensation of everybody living two lives or maybe even three lives. A, a home life which is rich and uh, creative and warm, and friendly, uh, and a public life which is hypocritical and you know, depressing and full of fear. And it's a very strange mixture. That's not like America. I mean, you don't feel... <laughs> well, luckily I had introductions and I would um, go off the beaten track and um, once you get on another level then you, you immediately, there's, there's enough, um, because of the welfare state system there, uh, dissidents can do what they want and um, I went to a Christmas party and of course Christmas is banned and uh, here were these people meeting in the house, um, there's a man singing with a guitar a poet who was a painter, and he, we didn't speak any Russian, and they only, they spoke very little English. But you got an idea that, um, that they were su supported, in a sense, the state, uh, and there's enough slack, since they don't have to work, a lot of them, it's, it's like they're almost all in the dole, um, so they have time on their hands to do what they want, as long as they don't do it officially, which suggests why, you know, so many people like Solzhenitsyn are alive there. I mean, thousands. It's very, very deep, that kind of culture, home life culture. So. Back to, excuse me, one question. Back to the history, this thing about the constructivist site. I can't help but feel that, like you were also talking in your book, The Modern Movements, about Tent City in Boston, various movements happened in the late 60s. Mm -hmm. Do you see them at all related to this? It's maybe an historical parallel. In several cases, yes. I mean, I think that if what I call the activist tradition, I think the constructivists were uh, definitely in that tradition. They were socially activist, even if they were right wing, left wing, or slightly right wing, left wing, you know. Um, and they tied that to a visual visually creative movement. And in that sense, the activists of the 60s um, tie up partly. I mean, say, advocacy planning or, um, or the Jacobite movement, uh, which is socially inspired, 
on certain levels, maybe not politically inspired, although advocacy planning is socially inspired. Um, they're definitely activists, interventionists, uh, and um, in that sense they, they inherit partly aware, partly unaware of, of what was happening in Russia. Wall art, right? I mean the wall art, Chicano art, for instance. I mean, I don't think that's directly aware, but through so Diego Rivera and um, all the communists of the, of the 30s, you find direct link-ups in a, in a very precise sense. Those were guys that were in, they weren't in the Soviet Union. Though. Well, no, they weren't in the Soviet Union, but they were really part of the international, and they were part of the, the American international, you know? That, that's a crowning irony of, who is it, Rivera? Is it Diego Rivera or someone? Where? Who does the, um, the murals in Rockefeller Center? Do you know those with Lenin in it and, and the... <laughs> for Rockefeller. And he does these and, and you know, he shows the, the, the communist dialectic occurring in the greatest capitalist building in the world for the greatest capitalist. And of course Rockefeller is reminded of that fact by a reporter or something. And, and the day before they're opened, they're, they're, they're washed over and destroyed. Well, he goes on to, to Mexico, and that starts there, and then it comes right into L.A. So there's all sorts of um, direct linkages. Um, that's not maybe construct. it isn't constructivist. But um, I feel that wall art, and, and that sort of spontaneous art of the people on the streets and in the factories, you know, is somehow aware of that. Robert Sommer, although he doesn't go into it, mentions the, the Russian precedent. And you could um, fill as many books with uh, examples from Russia as you could from Los Angeles. You know, the very interesting parallels there. Well, it's, I've kept you off from the dinner problem. <laughs>